Separation anxiety is a stage of development in which the child experiences anxiety when they are separated from their primary caregiver, usually the mother. Although the child is expressing a normal and essential survival instinct, it can also lead to some significant tantrums and meltdowns, and many parents find it problematic if it continues as the child gets older. I'm Dr. Scott Koenig, a licensed clinical psychologist, and this is Parent Savers Episode 46, Helping Parents Deal with Separation Anxiety. Faster than a speeding toddler. Sit still for just a minute. Can soothe boo-boos with a gentle kiss. Did you get down from there? Able to clean poopy bottoms in a single swipe. Oh, what did you eat? Turning frazzled mommies and daddies into procreators of peace and harmony. Ah, quit touching me. It's Parent Savers, empowering new parents everywhere. Welcome, everyone, to Parent Savers, broadcasting from the Birth Education Center of San Diego. I'm John O'Reill, and as your host, I'm here to have conversations about subjects that parents of young kids care about. On Parent Savers, we engage with experts in the field as well as parent panelists just like you. We've got a couple in studio, but we also want you to be a part of the show as well. So give us a tweet, call our hotline, leave a comment on our Facebook page, vote in a poll, send us in an email, do whatever it takes to help us help you get your questions answered and comments heard on Parent Savers. And in addition to listening and participating, please make sure to visit our website too, www.parentsavers.com, for more information about the topics we discuss. And while you're there, you can sign up for our free newsletter. And we also have a Parent Savers Club where you can download the archive episodes and get exclusive content and more. So make sure to visit parentsavers.com for more info on that. A little bit about myself. I'm a new again parent. My third son, Zyler, is one and a half. We also have two older boys, Corner and Whitaker, who just turned six and four. And I'm joined by a couple other new parents in studio. Hi, I'm Ursula McDonald. I'm 35. I'm um, a part-time office manager and a full-time mom of two boys, Desmond, who is four, and Callan, who is two. And I'm Amy Askin, and I am a mother of three girls, the three mermaids as we call them, (laughs) Olivia, who is eight, Serene, who is three, and newborn Elisiana. And she's actually with us in studio today. (laughs) Dr. Koenig, how about you? Uh, I have two children. I have a six-year-old boy and a four-year-old boy and um, hundreds of others, but uh, they get to see me only once a week, so (laughs) they they go home to their moms. (laughs) One of our listeners, Laura from Rhode Island, tweeted us this question. My 27-month-old little boy has been potty trained for a solid two months, but in the last three days, he's regressed and started pooping in his underwear. Any ideas? Hi, this is Dr. Frederick Johnson calling in. It sounds as if you have a normal 27-month-old who hasn't quite got the whole idea of potty training down, or he has some issue with something else going on in his life that he's decided he wants to take control. So this is where patience comes in, and you'll just need to reintroducing him to the potty chair, and hopefully he will get the hint, but boys always seem to take longer, and it's especially with poofing. So that would be my suggestion. So hope that answers all your questions, and I'll talk to everyone later. Bye-bye. It makes sense that infants and toddlers are scared to leave the safety of those who care for them the most, but that doesn't make it any easier to deal with it when you'd like to, for example, go to the bathroom or, you know, the heavenly grail for uh, parents, take a shower some days. Um, so, but today we're talking about separation anxiety with Dr. Scott Koenig, a clinical family therapist based here in San Diego and someone I'm very excited to have on the show. Welcome, Dr. Koenig. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. So let's start, I guess, by talking about what separation anxiety is. Can you just tell us a little bit about what it is and what we mean by that? Sure. Well, you know, when we're looking at separation anxiety, we're looking at intense anxiety that a child experiences um, when they are separated or the threat of separation from their primary caregiver, typically from their mother. Though separation anxiety is a perfectly normal part of childhood development, it can be unsettling at times. What is it that causes that separation anxiety? Because, you know, when when they do have that, you, you... I don't know, maybe if you understand a little bit of what's causing it, maybe can help mitigate it a bit? Sure, yeah. Well, you know, somewhere between, I kind of like to say, you know, six to eight months, uh, babies develop what we refer to as object permanence, and they begin to understand that things and people exist when they're not present. 
uh, babies realize that uh, they can no longer see mom and dad, and that means you've gone away. That causes anxiety. And, you know, because babies don't have the ability to really have a concept of time, um, they don't understand yet that when uh, a mother or father leaves the room that they're not going to be coming back. So that kind of is those uh, initial signs of anxiety. Um, a parent can be at work or they could be in the next room. And the way the child experiences it is exactly the same. So do all babies on kind of some level experience it and it's just a matter of how they deal with it that's different? Or? Yes, to a degree as it's a part of normal healthy development and attachment. But if you look at separation anxiety on a spectrum, some babies will experience it more and some will experience it less. When we look how this fits into the nurture versus nature question uh, that is always uh, one needs to ask themselves, a child's own disposition can certainly play a role, but how a parent responds to their baby's needs can also exacerbate anxiety or help to reduce it. So I guess kind of said in different ways, it's there naturally, but it also can be molded and changed by how we as parents deal with it. For sure, yeah. So, um, you know, uh, you know, children respond to temperament. So a parent who's more calm and cool and collected and see the way I'm talking right now. Um, <laughs> um, We're so, all falling asleep. Yeah, right, as everyone's <laughs> falling asleep. Well, that's, that's, that's a good thing, right? Um, so, you know, no, a, a parent's temperament plays a role as well. You know, all kids are going to experience anxiety. Um, so that's something that uh, is, is very common and very typical and very normal. But, um, you know, when, when a child is emotional and a parent responds to that in an emotional way, that often we're going to see a heightened level of anxiety. But, you know, typically um, when a parent can remain calm in those situations um, and really be consistent with the tone of their voice and their strategies, um, often you'll see a, a reduction in anxiety. It's interesting. Um, Amy and Ursula, do you guys have do you guys have so many experiences with separation anxiety with any of your multiple kids? Definitely. Um, my eldest child is uh, um, high maintenance. <laughs> <laughs> she's delightful, but I think um, especially because she's the first, we having been around tons of kids and having been an elementary school teacher, I had seen exactly what Dr. Koenig is talking about um, to, as a kindergarten teacher especially, <laughs> although I think that the separation anxiety happens more on the parental end on <laughs> the right. first day of school. <laughs> uh, but seriously, um, our, our eldest still to that, I mean she's eight, eight and a half, and she's still at times, you know, with my husband traveling and what have you, um, it has a certain level of anxiety and so we just talk through it and um, like Dr. Koenig said, we, we make sure that we define where he's going, when he'll be back. We have a strategy. We have a, a kind of a set role, you know, role playing thing that we do. And that helps a ton. And we definitely set up kind of fun activities to do, you know, not not to I don't want to say not deal with it, but we definitely put that in place. So she's ready and she has something to look forward to and it kind of gets her mind off of it. But my second child does pretty darn well with it. I mean, she I don't know. She just seems a bit mellower. And so. She seems to handle it a little better. And I think second time around, too, it's a little easier for us as parents. Yeah. You know, you get used to those triggers and you see what's what's going on and you are mellower yourself. So it seems like when the kids are a little older and you can explain things to them mm -hmm. a little bit and, you know, like your mommy will come back, you know, and then when they see you, like you did come back. Yeah. <laughs> but it's hardest, I think, when they're babies and like about the thing of taking a shower. You know, I remember my oldest and I was a new mom and. I had to take a shower because we had to go to the doctor's appointment. I didn't want to show the pediatrician that I hadn't sh showered in who knows how long. <laughs> so I'd set him up in the little bouncy chair in the bathroom with right. a clear shower curtain, you know, only use the clear one and have like some music going on. And he'd still scream and cry through the whole thing. Like, you know, it was like the worst thing in the world. And um, I think I, every mom goes through that. Yeah. Or the, the car, one, yeah. too. The, the, my second one hated being in the car seat and mm. facing backwards and and so you know yeah you want to remain calm and try to talk through it with them um but as they're like this as the parent you get like this and mm. so it's hard to remember that um you need to provide that kind of soothing kind of uh energy when you're you're responding you're to activated, them yeah. yeah i'm finding that with this one with number mm. three that it's been three and a half years and so when she's activated and really yelling i'm like please be calm 
<laughs> you know, and I'm trying to be calm, but it just makes me sad. You know, mm-hmm. it's very, yeah. Do you see that, Dr. Koenig, either some of those examples they talked about or maybe some other situations that cause separation anxiety, like maybe being in a large, crowded public place that's loud or maybe at nighttime it, it kind of builds a little bit more? Yeah, well, yeah, it's quite common for the anxiety uh, to intensify depending on the situation and where you are. And, um, you know, some babies and toddlers will show more anxiety in public places, as you said, new places that they've never been to before. And certainly at nighttime, that can be a very uh, scary time for children. My wife and I refer to that as the witching hour. That's what we call it in our house, too. Or the witching. Between four and eight. The the witching. (laughs) The four four hours uh, (laughs) where the witch comes. Um, But another thing to remember is that as your child develops, they will begin to pick up and read more social cues. And they will be able to see from your actions and behaviors that you're about to leave. And the anxiety actually begins to build and develop before you actually leave the room or leave to go to work or what have you. Well, that I have a question about that now because my youngest is two. And so on the nights when I do get a babysitter or something, it's at what point should I be introducing the fact that I'm going to be going? You know, do I, I don't want to do it too early and like have him anxious the whole day. Um, but I don't want to spring it on him last minute. Is there a sweet spot for somebody about that age of when to kind of let them know that they could be anticipating a separation? Sure. I think most of the times what I recommend um, is that, you know, if a, a caregiver is coming during the day or at night, a babysitter, and um, that you schedule them to come a bit earlier, mm-hmm. you know, not uh, five minutes before you're running out of the house. Have them come earlier, spend some time with you. Uh, Let them see that you're developing a rapport with them as well. Um, We tell them, you know, about before dinner time, like say we're going on a seven o'clock date or something. We tell them, you know, before dinner time. And then what we've gotten to do as we had number two was we already set up like every time we go out, we have you pick their favorite things, like whether it's their favorite dinner and favorite movie or something, something to like bonding time that you as a family do. Mm -hmm. And you make it like the, the caregivers. And I always have the caregiver come. That's a good point. I've always had them come during the day. I think because I was a uh, daycare person, I know, because we've I've been on the receiving end of getting the anxious child. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but if you get them during the day and you have like a little play date or something, and then you say, oh, remember, Miss Ursula is coming to watch you and you guys are going to have pizza from such and such. And you're going to watch this movie together. You're going to read this story. And they're like, Mm, but then they would kind of buy in a little bit better. Is that reasonable or is that mm-hmm. kooky? <laughs> no, I think I think rituals are great. You know, mm-hmm. consistent rituals. You know, consistent bedtime routines. Um, but but you're right. It's finding that sweet spot. Um, you know, you don't want to spring it on them. Um, you know, five minutes before you're leaving the house. But you also don't want to tell them too early where that anxiety is really going to uh, be at its peak. So again, it's finding that sweet spot. I like your idea of having you know a ritual. Maybe it's a favorite movie, it's a favorite book, it's, but you know, you definitely got to let them know that you're leaving. Uh, and especially if your child is not sleeping through the night, you know, the worst thing you want is for them to wake up and have a stranger come into their room and try to soothe them. Um, so, you know, it's, you got to kind of experiment. Every child's different, but, um, you know, an hour before you're going out, a couple hours before you're going out might be appropriate. But again, have that person who's coming into your home, if it's a babysitter or a caretaker, have them come early, have them come a bit on the early side so they can see how you interact with that person. That should calm down some of that anxiety as well. We've got to take a break, but I think that we've started talking a little about some strategies to deal with separation anxiety, and we'll talk about that even a little bit more uh, on the other side here. So we'll be right back. All right, welcome back to Parent Savers. We're talking to Dr. Scott Koenig about separation anxiety. And in the first segment, we talked a little about what separation anxiety is, as well as, well as starting to cover off on some strategies to deal with some specific kinds of it. But uh, now let's dig a little bit deeper into that, um, as well as look at some other angles for separation anxiety. You know, are there some times, Dr. Koenig, that separation anxiety is okay? I mean, after all, you know, these kids are looking to you know, the person that's their safety and their safety blanket. So what are some times where it's okay? And then when do you kind of know when it crosses the threshold from being okay to being a problem? That's a great question. Well, it's okay from the perspective that when it's occurring at early stages of development, it's a, you know, really strong indication that your child is forming healthy attachments to the primary caregivers. 
Um, that is, you know, that is what we want to see. Um, however, if intense separation anxiety lasts into preschool, elementary school, or beyond, and really is interfering with the child's daily activities, you know, those are some red flags, and it could be a sign of a more serious condition known as separation anxiety disorder. So those are the kind of things we want to monitor. And then um, maybe what are some other things parents can do to help babies with separation anxiety? Okay. Well, yeah, as we were talking before, you know, in general, I think the more mellow and flexible the parents can be, uh, the more flexible the child will be. And the more nervous and tense and unwilling to part with the baby the parents are, the more likely the child will experience separation anxiety. Um, as parents, we want to always keep in mind that one of the most important gifts early gifts you can give your child is really that ability to self-soothe, meaning you're allowing them the opportunities to regulate their own emotions. So you want to keep it light. I, I tell that to parents a lot. Keep it light. You know, your baby is very tuned into how you feel. So you want to keep it light and, you know, just create a lot of warmth and enthusiasm, especially if a caregiver is coming over. You want to be really excited about it and try not to act upset and try not to act sad that you're leaving your child. Um, another strategy is once you leave, you leave. Right. Um, don't Huge come back. One. Yeah. Um, right. That's you like, you harkens see, back to the kindergarten. First yeah. Day of kindergarten. Yeah. I was yeah. going to say you see that a lot around <laughs> school. You know, and, yeah. and, and the teachers are like, "Leave, leave! I got this." And right. you know, and and it's hard. It's hard. I'm I'm not discounting the fact oh. that it's hard for a parent to see to see those tears. Well, and that kind of happens like when we have to drop uh, our kid off at the babysitter daycare. You know, during the day, like it's so weird and counterintuitive. But really, the whole idea is get in, get out. Like, all right, here he is. See you later. Have a good day. I'll talk to you when we pick him up because right. I don't want to wait and linger anymore right now. Yeah. Yeah. My, uh, my husband and I used to argue over who got pickup because she would run to your arms. And right. it was like you were the coolest person on the planet. Well, and then you can also visit then if there's updates you need. But at right. drop off, it's all business. Yeah. You know, exactly. in, out. Right. Let's go. You can also practice separation in which you leave your child with a caregiver for brief periods and short distances at first. And if possible, you try to have a consistent caregiver, you know, not somebody new each week or each month or so someone consistent. Um, a transitional object is often a really good recommendation. A little, a little blanket, a stuffed animal, a little action figure. Um, and I like to uh, encourage parents to develop what I call a goodbye ritual. So it's it, it's short and, and it's concise and it's not drawn out and it could be it could be uh, something nonverbal like a hug or a kiss or it could be um, you know a very short phrase that you say every time when you're leaving your child so they kind of come be, become conditioned that uh, be you're example? about to leave them. What would be an example of a phrase? Uh, mommy loves you. Bye bye. Okay. Um, mommy will be back soon. Um, or dad. We're yeah. not talking about dads at all. Um, you know, <laughs> we uh, got two dads. Right yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Um, so, yeah, just something really sweet. Um, you know, love you, bye bye, be back soon. You know, just just short. You don't want to. You want to have a long monologue. You don't want to yeah. <laughs> draw it <laughs> out. Right. Draw it out too much. Yeah. You mentioned earlier that, um, and we talked a little about it being normal for around six to eight months as they're learning object permanence. Um, I was reading a little bit about separation anxiety and that it's like quote unquote supposed to end around the age of two years old that that's when they can kind of start understanding I think a little bit more and, and maybe even the beginning probably not time concepts but the beginnings of that you're coming back and that it's not permanent um, but what happens if it goes past that I mean I mean even if it's just a couple months but even going into a couple of years like what happens if it goes past sure that? good question well I, I generally recommend to parents that if the behavior is still occurring past two years of age uh, that the first step would be to start to collect some data and actually measure the behavior. Okay, so it might sound very clinical, but it's actually very easy. Now, the three units of measurement I suggest are frequency, duration, and intensity. So we're looking to see how often the separation anxiety is occurring, how long it's occurring for, and how intense is the anxiety. I would recommend measuring this for about a week or two. And after data collection, we could then start to see if the separation anxiety is, let's say, it's not within what we would consider normal limits any longer. And we can then develop and um, kind of strategize more consistent behavioral interventions to help reduce your child's anxiety. You know, then it kind of speaks to the question, raises the question of, you know, how do you know what's in within normal limits? 
And, you know, it's a bit of a gray area, but, you know, I, I, I guess it's, you know, mother's intuition or father's intuition, parental uh, intuition. I, I think, you know, I, I think as a parent, if we're really kind of tapping into what's going on with our child, we know if it's kind of reached a point where, wow, like this is no longer kind of, you know, just normal kind of crying stuff when I leave. This is really kind of becoming a problem. And it's not only interfering with my child's well-being, but really the whole family system. So when you're monitoring it, I mean, is it a notebook? Do you, I mean, if you've had parents do this for you, is it a notebook or... You know, they have apps for everything else when you're monitoring kids. Right. I, wonder I know, we need an app for this. No, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's <laughs> on, on a sticky or a notebook or, yeah, I mean, just, you just want to see. Because sometimes yeah. I think as, as parents, um, some sometimes we have a tendency to kind of overrate right. or underrate things that are going on, especially new parents. Yeah. So it, I like seeing data. I mean, you know, I think yeah. it's really helpful. And And one of the reasons why I like to collect the data, you know, so we get a baseline. And then if there are some behavioral strategies that we're going to try and implement, instead of just kind of playing the guessing game, well, well, I think it might be a little bit better. We actually have real proof that what we're doing is actually working. Would that be something that um, you would try? I mean, I know it's early on. This is a six-week-old baby, but we're struggling with the sleeping thing. And even during the day, she's kind of cranky and, you know, colicky and that kind of thing. Is that something worth doing or is that not I mean I know it's very early but I'm saying like when yeah. when I we keep talking about when separation anxiety ends but when does it even begin I mean begin. Or, yeah. I mean is this too early is this all just like nurturing you know kind of stuff yeah. that we need to and, worry about or yeah that, and that's a really good question I, I would say usually around six months okay. of age it starts to really kind of kick in and then um, you know anywhere from 10 to 18 months it's probably at its peak And then, you know, um, it can kind of persist and go on longer. But at at this age, I don't think it's something that you need to be strategizing about at this stage. (laughs) This this baby that we're talking about. And the baby's been in the studio this whole time, too. I know. She makes me a liar. See? (laughs) That's what, yeah. You're like, yeah, that baby doesn't cry. What are you talking about? What do you do when, um, say, you've already moved past that kind of babyhood stage of separation anxiety and... um, either it maybe it comes back when they're a little bit older i mean how do you do deal with that or should that be a red flag to you that maybe the situation you're leaving them in isn't good or yeah well you know i i think we're we're then sometimes looking at if this persists again into i would say you know preschool elementary school and beyond you know we we may be looking at something which we refer to as separation anxiety disorder um, when it's no longer within normal limits. Um, and again, you got to trust your judgment. But, um, you know, that's, you know, we have professionals, you know, in the field that, that can help kind of evaluate this and look at this. I would say for older, older children, some of the things that you may see, which may be some red flags, would be, you know, fear that uh, something terrible will happen to someone that they love. Um, worry that an unpredicted event will lead to permanent separation. For example, they may worry about being kidnapped or getting lost. Um, They may have nightmares about separation. They may refuse to go to school. Um, They may display a high level of reluctancy to go to school. Um, Often kids will complain of physical symptoms. They got a headache or a stomach ache. Um, And and just, uh, you know, that, that clinginess, which, you know, at a certain point you just... You know, that shouldn't be going on anymore. So as a parent who's trying to deal with these issues, whether in the younger kids or the older kids, you know, what where can we turn to for help or what can we do if nothing that we're doing is working? Sure. Well, no, you first and and, and I really, really like to drive this point home. You, you, you always first want to consult with your pediatrician or your family doctor. You always want to rule out anything medical before you do anything. Um, so that would be the first uh, thing that, that I would recommend. Um, if the separation anxiety is just not going away naturally, you may want to schedule a consultation with a psychologist or a therapist who works with children for an evaluation. Um, therapists who, who do specialize in working with children can often help a child by increasing their coping skills, um, helping them learn to self-soothe, which we talked about before, um, challenging their negative thoughts into more positive thinking. We call that cognitive restructuring, um, giving them new behavioral strategies to try, um, and, and, and helping you as parents as well and empowering you and 
um, giving you different ways to look at situations and kind of help your kids through that as well. All right, I think we covered a lot of information on this show. Is, um, and I think that Dr. Koenig's voice is an excellent reminder to one of the key tips to be calm and soothing <laughs> and to help the, to help your kids. So thanks again, Dr. Koenig, for helping us learn more about separation anxiety. Really enjoyed having you on the show. Hopefully you can be a part of Parent Savers again in the future. Um, if you as a listener want more information about today's show, go to the episodes page on parentsavers.com. And we're also going to link more information about Dr. Koenig and his practice there and some other resources about separation anxiety. Uh, actually, our conversation is going to continue for just a little bit with Dr. Koenig after the show for our Parent Savers Club members. So stick around for that. And if you were interested in being a part of that, definitely see sign up on our website. Um, we're going to talk a little more about ways to prepare babies for when we will be apart. We covered that a little bit more, but we've got a couple more tips that we're going to share. Before we wrap things up, here's blogger Deween Richard sharing some fatherly advice from his blog, Daddy Doing Work. Hey, everybody. It's Harris Sanders. It's Deween Richard from the blog Daddy Doing Work, which is all about being a new dad. And today I'm talking about what it was like on our first plane trip. I live in Los Angeles, and we flew to Hawaii for a family vacation. And listen, I will tell you right now, I lost sleep. I mean, I lose sleep as a parent anyway to a toddler, but I lost sleep due to worry. I was afraid my kid would just go nuts. But it actually worked out pretty well because let me tell you, if you're a new parent and you're thinking about taking a kid on a plane, let me tell you how I dealt with it, and it worked out really, really well. The first thing I did was I brought my iPad. Now, if you do not own an iPad, you need to go get yourself an iPad. I'm serious. It's the best $700 you will spend in your lifetime. Nothing keeps a toddler more entertained than Dora the Explorer episodes or some movies or maybe some of those apps that you can get on iTunes like the Duck, Duck Moose apps where they're just learning things. Awesome. Save the day. It was fantastic. So I highly, highly recommend that. So the iPad, I also just made sure that she had some snacks available bought some new toys for her that I would bring out every now and then to keep her entertained and surprise her. And before you knew it, the flight was over. And she slept through a lot of it, not by the use of any Benadryl, by the way. So that's my tip for you guys. iPad, toys, games, and it's all good. I just want to thank you guys so much for listening. And if you have a parenting topic or an idea that you want to talk to me about, feel free to email me through my blog at daddydoingwork.com or you can go to my Facebook page which is facebook.com slash daddydoingwork and we will see you next time. Thank you so much. Have a good one. Bye-bye. That wraps up today's episode. Thanks again for joining us. We'd love to hear from our listeners. So if you have any questions at all, um, give us a tweet, leave us a comment on Facebook. We've got a Parent Savers hotline, number 619-866-4775. Send us an email through the website, parentsavers.com. You can send me an email there. Get in touch with us. and want to answer your questions. And don't forget, we're going to talk for a little bit more with Dr. Koenig right now for Parent Savers Club members. Next week, though, we're going to take a look at teething, which I know is an issue that goes on and on. <laughs> and a lot of times we forget that it's happening, but um, I'm gonna, we're going to learn a little more about what it is and how to deal with it. So thanks a lot, everyone, for listening to this episode of Parent Savers, Empowering New Parents. This has been a New Mommy Media production. The information and material contained in this episode are presented for educational purposes only. Statements and opinions expressed in this episode are not necessarily those of New Mommy Media and should not be considered facts. While such information and materials are believed to be accurate, it is not intended to replace or substitute for professional medical advice or care and should not be used for diagnosing or treating health care problem or disease or prescribing any medication. If you have questions or concerns regarding your physical or mental health or the health of your baby, Please seek assistance from a qualified health care provider. Hey, mamas. Don't forget to check out Mighty Moms. It's our online community built for new moms just like you. Not only can you connect with other moms, but you can also join us backstage for special mom-only online events. And you'll also be notified when we're recording so you can join us as a special guest. Visit our website, newmommymedia.com, and click on the Mighty Moms banner. It's free. That's newmommymedia.com. See you there.